All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that be, takes you behind the scenes in the writing and publishing world. Tonight, we have myself, the great, the all-powerful Jason Lavelle. We have Bella. Come here, Bella. Bella, the dancing cockatoo, everyone's favorite co-host. And then, of course, Katie Salitis. Hi, Katie, how are you tonight? Hi, Jason. Glad to be back. You're looking lovely this evening. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. Also joining us tonight, we have Jacob Devlin. Hi, Jacob. How's it going, everyone? It's going great, going great. And then we also have Yvonne Navarro. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, how you doing? Excellent. It still looks nice and sunny over there where you are. I wish it was nice and sunny here in Michigan. Now, you're in you're in Arizona. Jacob, where are you? I'm also in Arizona. Also in Arizona. Arizona. Okay. okay, okay, gotcha. Very cool. It's Sweet. hotter well, up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the mornings are starting to cool down a little bit, so we're really happy about that. But we'll we'll be sitting on 90 degrees for a little while longer. Our jacket weather is like two weeks long. <laughs> Holy smokes. And see, I went out yesterday wearing a sweater, a hoodie. You, know, you can always tell an Arizona person they're wearing these sweaters and these hoodies in 75 degree weather. <laughs> we'll die without it in 70 degrees. <laughs> oh, cool. So now let's talk a little bit about what you guys do. You guys are, are both traditionally published authors. Is that right? Yes. Oh, okay. look at him. <laughs> well, hello. Hello. <laughs> Yes, she's very affectionate until she starts biting your face, yeah. which may still be affection. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, Jacob, let's start with you here. Tell us a little bit about what you write. Yeah, so I write young adult fantasy. Um, it stems from, you know, fairy tales or legends and puts a different twist on them. So right now I'm about to finish up my first trilogy, which is called The Order of the Bell. It starts with Peter Pan and Pinocchio and Alice. And so they've all grown up. They're, uh, you know, living in their 30s and have teenage children of their own. And then the series follows those children as they kind of come to terms with the fact that they've descended from these fairy tale characters living in a new world. And um, one day the adults start to go missing. And so they have to basically band together, find each other, and then go out and solve the mystery of what happened to their families. So it's been a whole lot of fun to write. That sounds awesome. <laughs> that sounds very cool. Now, I where did you- the fairy tale retellings and the, the adaptations and new interpretations of fairy stories. Those are probably some of my favorites right now. And they're really hot in the market too. Oh yeah, for sure. And I. I love it. We just had our, our guest on uh, last week, uh, Christina Henry, and she does a lot of not necessarily fairy tale re retellings, but that type of story where you're you're kind of you're taking an old story and adding to it and changing it and going in your own direction. But I think there are a lot of fun. I read a really cool um, Beauty and the Beast one called The Cold King. I believe it was called or Cold King. It was it was wicked cool. So, I mean, you could definitely follow the storyline and and see how it was related, but uh, completely different characters, and it was um, it was neat. But anyhow, I kind of went off on my own direction there. So your, your stories sound <laughs> fantastic, Jacob. How long have you been writing? So I started writing, like I've always enjoyed it since I was probably about four years old. Like that was how I spent my time. Like I would get in trouble in class for reading and like writing little stories on my own. Like that's the thing I got in trouble for. But I got serious about it probably about three or four years ago and um, published my first book, the first part of the Order of the Bell Trilogy back in um, July of last year. So um, ever since then, I've been going pretty steady with it. Fantastic. Oh my gosh, you're a baby. <laughs> I know, I'm so young, right? <laughs> you still have so much to learn. It's so cool to talk to everyone. <laughs> I'll put a pin in that for now, because I do want to come back to your publishing journey. But let's talk to Yvonne about hers as well and, and what kind of books that she works on. Now, you've worked on the Buffy stories, is that correct? Yeah, I did. I I had a bunch of Buffy um, stories published in novellas and short stories, and I did seven original novels in the universe. Now, how did you get involved in writing in that universe? Because that is one of the most popular fandoms out there. Well, you know, I have to thank Nancy Holder and Christopher Golden for that. I'd known them both for many, many years, and I knew them for many, many years before this. The editor at the time was Lisa Clancy, and she was looking for more authors to expand 
or kind of stable of uh, Buffy authors, and they both recommended me. So she said, send me a writing sample, and I sent her my first novel, and then she said, you know, your agent's name, and I gave her that, and, and that started the whole thing. I was really tickled because I was a diehard Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. Oh, that is like one of the most popular fandoms out there. I mean, to this day, people love Buffy. And they do. Course, you know, writing in the, the vampire genres as well, that's another hot one. So <laughs> you know, it's like, that that's striking gold right there. Yeah, I, to me, it was, it was like a dream come true. I was just going to say, now, how many different stories in the Buffy universe did you get to write? I wrote three novellas in the uh, Tales of the Slayer, which were tales of Slayer's in the Buffy universe, but at other times they weren't, they didn't know Buffy or any of them. What did I, else did I do? I wrote a couple of stories in an angel anthology and it might be it. Yeah, that might be it. Okay. Now you have, I, I noticed on your site that you've written, you know, not only with a, with a Buffy, but you written for aliens as well i wrote a novel in the aliens universe it was a novelization an expansion of a three issue graphic novel by chet williamson okay so now I, i'm curious yeah we, we kind of just touched on that with with katie's question but these things seem they're they're so mainstream and so popular that to me, looking looking at the works you've done, I'm like, wow, I don't even know how you would go about approaching someone about writing in this universe. How, how did that, that come to pass? It was the second novelization I did. The first one was for the old movie Species. Yeah. And I had finished my first novel. I was working on the second one. I managed to somehow swing a three book contract based on the first novel, which was completed when it was submitted. I had finished that. I was working on the second one, and the editor at Bantam approached my agent and said, you know, I'm looking for an author who writes well, who might like to write this book. And, that, you know, I could, I could write the book, no problem. Um, but they were taking it a little bit of a chance on me because when they look for an author to do this, they're also looking for an, an author who can meet a deadline. And they had no indication of whether or not I could. But they took a chance, and I did. And then I went back to work on my second novel, and then the same editor went back and said, we have this novelization that we, the, this three-book graphic comic book that we want to blow up into a novel. Can you do it? And I said, absolutely. So it, it took a little while for the second novel to come out. Now, when uh, they give you a deadline, about how long are they allowing for the writing process? Well, in days of yore, <laughs> they would give you a novelization and you could manage to squeeze about four months out of them. You might have a movie coming out with it, but in days of yore, again, they started the whole process earlier. So it wasn't such a slam on the deadlines. It, it, about four months. Okay. And, and for a lot of authors who are used to writing more than one book a year, that's, that doesn't seem too excessive. You know, and if you're doing a true novelization, you're going off of a script of something, or like I did with the graphic novel, the whole thing was laid out, and that's your outline. Mm -hmm. And you follow it, and you flesh it out, and you talk about the characters and what the characters are thinking, and their pasts or whatever. So it, I actually find movie novelizations a lot of fun. That would be awesome to do. I would love to try doing that. Yeah, it sounds and that's like not something we've explored yet either. We, we've talked about indie publishing, we've talked about small press, we've talked about traditional. We've never talked about adapting, uh, adapting other work or, you know, movie novelizations. That's a totally different area that I don't think a lot of authors know is out there. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately nowadays they have really cut the time that they get around to finding an author for this. Um, and it's just, it sometimes it's really kind of onerous, mm. especially because I have one publisher who's kind of, who kind of mixed up the term novelization and prequel to something. And the prequel is an original novel. So they kind of use the thing interchangeably. So I thought I was doing a novelization. I'm not. 
Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That puts you in a little bit of a tight spot then. Yeah. <laughs> so, so from what it sounds like, you know, getting into doing these novelizations, it sounds like that's more of a by referral kind of thing that you're doing where editors or other authors that have worked with you or agents that have worked with you are recommending you for jobs. Does that sound pretty accurate or? Um, in some ways it is. Uh, the project I'm working on, the publisher apparently published, re, like reissued one of my previous novelizations and they liked the work I'd done on that. So they suggested me for another one because I don't currently have an agent. So they just contacted me via email and they said, well, we have this and would you like to do it? And I said, absolutely. Cool. Now that brings up a really interesting point because we talked last week about having agents be kind of your, um, your go-to that in between, they help you get the next level, the, the contract with the publisher. But both of you, if I understand correctly, went directly to your publishers. Jacob, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I went directly to the publishers. And um, actually, I got my start through Twitter. So I have social media to thank for everything. Wow. Yeah, so I never landed an agent. Instead, I would do PitMat every three months. They do this about every three months. Um, and I had like 10 different tweets that I would kind of rotate throughout each um, cycle. And then I was pitching the Carver for about a year, I think. And it was December 2015 that I finally ended up landing. You know, I um, had, a, I used TweetDeck, like I scheduled all these things and then I forgot about it the next day. And then uh, all of a sudden I started getting, you know, a couple likes. I think I got three, you know, bites from the Vent Agency and a couple different agents. But um, the one that caught my eye was uh, Blaze Publishing. They were still just kind of getting their, their start. Um, but they, and then I went in um, you know, kind of looked at their profile and their website and they said, you know, if we like your tweet during PitMad, you know, send us three sample chapters. And I'd already kind of done that for a couple other people, so I still didn't have my hopes up, but I sent my sample chapters. Um, they got back about four or five days later. Um, I got a phone call actually from the, the assistant. And, and she said, you know, we just want to know where you're at with everything. You know, how many people are reading this? How many agents, uh, you know, publishers do you have this out to right now? And um, I, in the end, I was like, oh, you know, a few, but I didn't have any bites at that time. So they were like, Let, let's keep it that way. Like, please don't, like, don't accept everything until we get back to you again. Um, then I, I still didn't want to get my hopes up. I was like, you know, there's a possibility, like, what if she gets to the end and she's like, oh, I hate it, like, throw it away. But um, then a couple days later, they actually called me again and said, you know, we, we really like this. Let's um, go ahead and if you're interested, let's make a deal. And so it kind of spiraled through Twitter, actually. That's now, awesome. Can we, because um, I want to, to talk about this a little bit, for our audience who are primarily new or indie authors who are just getting their feet wet, what is PitMad? Can you explain Yes, that? please, because I have no yeah, idea please. what you're talking about. <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. So it's one of many different contests that happens on social media every now and then to get um, new authors discovered. And so for this particular one, PitMad, you go and you write one tweet, just summarizing your book, you know, trying to make that best possible pitch. I can't even really remember what my winning tweet ended up saying, but uh, 120 characters and then you use the hashtag PitMad and then all day long, agents and editors and publishers, they're kind of swimming around digging through this huge slush pile of tweets and then they're liking all the ones that they're interested in. And then um, you go and you look at their profile and they usually say, if I like this, you know, send me a query and send me a the chapters and then it kind of goes from there. So um, it happens about every three months if you go on, um, there's a website where you can find the dates, but they plan this out like a year at a time. You know, you can kind of schedule all your tweets, start thinking about um, your tweets and then kind of go from there. And there's a few of them actually. There's Pitch Madness, which is the Pit Mad. Um, there was one that just happened recently and I can't remember the name of it, but you can look up the tweet, uh, Twitter pitches or Twitter um, PitchCon, and it'll provide a list of different ones to use. And throughout the year, there's a lot of, like you said, different contests and different ways to kind of give yourself a leg up in the slush pile. Because if an agent or an editor likes what you've tweeted, you put that in your query. You say, you know, found, you know, you liked this during Pitch Madness and it bumps you up in visibility when you send that query through. It's true. And it's a great place to make community too, because other authors, they can go and retweet each other and kind of give, right. give their support. So it's a great way to kind of boost your own following and get to know other authors out there. Yeah. Uh, two weeks ago, when we talked to Weston, he'd also brought up 
uh, manuscript wish manuscript wish list, and that's a hashtag MSWL, and that is agents actually posting, hey, this is what I'm looking for. So it's another resource for uh, authors out there that are aspiring to, you know, get their first novel published to try and match themselves with an agent that might be looking for exactly what they're writing. So tell us a little bit about uh, Blaze Publishing. Um, you say that it's a small press, you said? Yeah, it's small. Um, they're growing a little bit. They, you know, they're, they recently expanded from young adult to also middle grade. They're accepting middle grade now. Um, and their big mission is just to find books with, with heart. That's kind of their tagline, books with blazing hearts. And so they will accept any kind of YA and middle grade novel. So they have a couple contemporaries out, romance. They have, um, I'm kind of one of their fantasy right now. And then um, sci-fi has been pretty big. We have a couple authors who are doing like space operas and such. So, so they're kind of looking for a little bit of everything, but they release about five or six novels every year. You're going on book three with them right now, right? Or you already have three out? I have two novels and then one short story that we just put directly to Kindle. Okay. Third novel is coming out in February. Okay, okay. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a couple minutes here. But tell me what your what has your experience been like with them, working with a, with a small press publisher? Oh, it's been fantastic, okay. yeah. Um, I, I really didn't know what to expect with them. I, I know I've heard some horror stories in the past about other small press publishers and, um, you know, just kind of taking away your freedom and chopping out chapters without consulting you first. But everything with Blaze has been a true partnership and a conversation about every aspect of it. Um, they... Uh, when I first signed my contract, you know, they sent me a bunch of files at the beginning. They said, you know, draw your dream cover and let's talk about what you want to see on the cover and what the themes of your manuscript are. And then, so I made this like terrible kindergarten sketch and, and sent it back to her. And <laughs> you got your crayons back out. <laughs> right? <laughs> But uh, from there, we just had a really good conversation. You know, it turned out we were thinking along the exact same wavelengths. We both wanted to see the mirror on the first cover, and um, we had ideas about like the font and the the general feel of it. And so, we we kind of negotiated, and it was a very easy conversation. And and it's been about that with the the whole entire book too. You know, when my when my editor returns returns my manuscripts to me, you know, she makes her comments and she says, you know, if you don't agree with something, let's talk it out. Let's negotiate and find out a way to um, make it so it still fits your vision too. So I've been very, very happy with their cooperation. Fantastic. Um, now, it's, it's funny, that's a, a very stark contrast to some of the things we, we've heard about traditional publishing. And um, our guest last week, uh, Christina Henry, um, who is a, a big five author, and she had told us she she has almost no... Oh, wait, hang on. Let's, I mean, Katie, say something so we can see you. Oh, I didn't want to interrupt what you were saying, but I, I had some of his books because I met him back nice. in the East, so. Those and are awesome beautiful covers, covers. I love them. Very yeah. nice. Absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> um, now, one thing, very happy. one thing that um, Christina was telling us is that she really doesn't have much input at all into what happens with covers, what happens with with kind of any kind of formatting or, or back matter or anything like that. But uh, from what it sounds like with you, at least with your experience with Blaze, that it, it really has been more of a partnership. Yeah, definitely. So I've been very happy with that because ultimately, you know, I have this whole vision that I've had going for from the beginning. And, you know, they've been very understanding of that and they don't kind of like step on my toes. And they, But they also, you know, offer a lot of feedback to make it so that what my vision was in the beginning. They, they've increased it tenfold and made it so much bigger than I thought it was going to be. So it's it's been a great partnership. That's fantastic. Now, now before you started submitting to your Twitter rampage mystical magical thing, whatever that was, that I'm sure I'll, I'll have to learn about later. Um, <laughs> did you did you ever consider going the indie route, publishing yourself, or were you always focused on on finding a publisher? I thought about going indie for a while. Um, I was getting to a point where I was getting a little bit frustrated. You know, I, I had been submitting for about a year, um, but you know, it was, I was pretty dead set on things. Like I got to a point where I was getting very close. Like um, I would hear back from agents. I was trying to find an agent first, and um, a lot of them would give like their standard, you know, form rejections, no feedback. Every like every now and then, I would get one that was like, "This, you know, it's it's just not quite what I'm looking for, but it's fantastic. Like you'll you'll find somebody, you know." And so at that point, I was like, "Okay, yeah, I I can do this. You know, I'm getting so close to it." And so uh, just keeping up with Pitmat and keeping those queries going, and um, and that's kind of uh, where what led me to where I am right now. Okay, and and 
what does your what does your publisher do for you? Because it, my understanding of of small press publishers is you have a little bit of backing in that they're gonna they're gonna help you with the cover art and they're gonna help you with the marketing. But what kind of responsibilities are are left to you? Are you still doing a lot of marketing yourself, or, or how does that work? How does your partnership work with them? Yeah, it's kind of 50-50. They do a lot of marketing on their own time. Like they'll they'll reach out to their contacts and they partnered with the distributor. So um, just kind of get books out into libraries and every now and then we'll run into them at Barnes and Noble and such, which is really fun. Awesome. Um, but yeah, they, they do ask me to, to maintain a lot of that myself. You know, they expect they have certain expectations for social media. So I try to be very active on Instagram, Twitter, kind of thinking about my own personal brand. Um, and that's that's kind of the main thing. You know, they say, you know, like be active, go out and, you know, sell yourself. We'll help you sell the book. So. Okay. Now, uh, you. Yvonne, just to contrast that, do you have the same feel with the bigger publishers? Do they kind of leave a lot of the marketing to you or do they kind of tell you, this is what we're doing, these are places we're sending you and you kind of do what, they're, what they want? They don't tell you anything. <laughs> and they, actually for a mid-list author, they do almost no marketing and maybe no marketing at all. I have found that if I want marketing, I need to do it myself. Way back when I worked on After Age, I did a lot of marketing for that. I had bookmarks printed. I paid for an ad in the local. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember because I'm old. When you went to the theater, they used to have those little booklets that would tell you about the upcoming shows. And they had little like business card sized ads in them. And I put one of those for After Age in a, in a movie theater. I did you know, what I could, what I could afford. And I remember calling my editor and I had gotten an offer from Cemetery Dance um, saying, you know, we can run this ad for you for your, your book, you know, for $60. And I was at the end of my budget um, back then. This was 1993. And so I called my editor and I, I asked if, you know, the publisher would pay for it. And then she was like, no, hmm. no, no, we don't do that. No. So I don't know what kind of marketing I got. Probably not much. <laughs> okay. Okay. And now that one, then that was, you said earlier on in, in your career, now that you've been writing for a long time and you have many published works, um, do you find that they're, that they approach things with your, with your books any differently or is it very much the same? You know, it, I think it's still pretty much the same. It depends on the novelization. You know, I'm still doing uh, solo work and you get, <laughs> you get more, you get more marketing on the novelizations if they're for a movie, you know, because obviously they're, they're pulling for the movie, but you know, even so, I don't think if you've written the book, you're writing on the movie's coattails, because if you've written a book to go with the movie, you will find your, the credit for the book at the very last of the credits, all the way down where, you know, the 45th key grip and, and, you know, this tree was photographed in and, and print about this big, it'll, it'll say novelization by so-and-so. <laughs> no dogs were harmed in the filming of this. Oh, and by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, we had to put this in at the end and we don't have any more film, so we're going to shrink the type down to about this big. <laughs> so, That's where everything speeds up really fast and the next episode comes on. And Right, right. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> That, that seems a little bit jaded. That's not good. I don't like that. No. <laughs> well, to me, the fun in it, you know, I mean, obviously I get, I get paid a little bit. They don't do royalties like they used to. I have never gotten a royalty. On, that's not true. I take that back. I've gotten royalties on one novelization, but the rest of them were just a flat fee. Oh. So they don't they don't do the royalties anymore. And the fun I think comes from writing the novelization. If you are looking at a subject that you really like, you're gonna rip right through it. It's gonna be so easy and so, you know, liking what you're writing about. I mean, you get the passion in there, you get the in-depth, and your characters seem really just alive. Oh yeah. Well, if somebody so, told me to write a an expansion of the the Terminator universe, I would just be in heaven. I'd be like, I'm just going to write exactly. this all the time. I'd never want to do anything else. Right, um, right. 
So, so no, not to not to get too personal here with you, and and you can ballpark us or just tell me to f off if if you want to. But people people would like to know this kind of stuff. So someone comes to you and and says, okay, we need you to write species six for us, you know, as okay. a, as a book because we're gonna we're gonna make a movie out of it or we're gonna make a, a TV series out of it. What okay. are they What are they paying you to write that? You said usually they're paying some kind of flat fee. What? Yeah, it depends. It de I see. I see it all over the place. Um, I know what I've worked for, but I have seen. I have seen uh, where people have paid like six thousand dollars for an entire book, which I think is just kind of like highway robbery in reverse. Even in a novelization, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna take you a while. You're gonna put some time into it. You're gonna put some, hopefully, some passion into it. And then I've seen up to ten thousand dollars. I think again that in the days of yore, when I was young, <laughs> they carried swords. Uh, I, I think the pay was more. Okay. Uh, but at that time, I wasn't. You know, before me, before me. So. You know, it varies, and and it's, you know if you don't have an agent, you're gonna have to work on negotiating this yourself. Okay. And I have done that. I haven't had an agent in quite some time, and you don't always win. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you can manage to get more contributor copies. <laughs> now, do you do other work outside of your writing, or is this your your full time job that you've done? This is my full time job. Um, I worked for the government. Uh, as a contractor, and my job was lined out um, in, 2000, in September 2014. Uh, before then, I was, uh, you know, I was working when I could in the evening. My job was too busy to get away with doing anything at work. And bef before I, w I went to work for them, um, I had a couple of years where I was on my own. But you know, I was I was always living in Daddy's basement. <laughs> I had some time when I had my own house, and then I left my job. Um, I worked at a law firm. I left my job, and I moved into my dad's basement. He wouldn't let me pay rent. In fact, he wouldn't let me pay anything. He wouldn't, you know, I had to like force him to let me buy groceries. <laughs> then Wes and I met, and then ultimately we we got married, and we moved down here to Arizona. I was in the Chicago area, and I went back to work just kind of to you know kind of settle things in. You know, I was living with my dad again because Wes was um, in, in, he was still in the army. He was in Los Angeles. Um, and then and then I found a job. I got a job and uh, I stayed with that company for, gosh, 10 and a half years. So when, you know, when my job stopped in September of 2014, I said, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to write full time. You've been happy with that decision? I, I am happy with that. I'm not really happy with my own lack of discipline. <laughs> you know, I feel like I'm a young writer again where everything was a, a distraction and, and you know, you're supposed to be in the mood to write and everything's supposed to be just perfect in your house, you know, and I have to get past that and I have gotten past some of it, but, you know, life still gets to me and I'm just like, I'm behind on this deadline. I have to let go of the dogs, you know. <laughs> Uh, That's like a good one for uh, for Jacob too. How how do you handle work and writing and finding time and staying uh, distraction free? It's definitely not easy. I'm not going to pretend it's easy. But uh, one thing I did that really helped me was I sat down and I like just did a little bit of math. Like I, I sat down and I figured out like how many hours actually exist in a week. How many hours do I have to devote to my job, which is at least 40. Sometimes it can go up to like 60, 70. Um, and then I subtracted like, how much time do I get for sleep? You know, let's pretend you get eight hours of sleep. And then I sat down and figured out, okay, like this is how much time I actually have to write. Like how much time am I actually going to use for that? Then I sit and I write like a weekly goal. So it'll, I'll say something like, if I'm writing a new novel, I'll say I want to get five chapters done or 3,000 words by the end of this week. And if I'm revising something, it'll be like, let me revise 
up through the first 10 chapters or let me revise all of this person's scenes, for example. So it's less about kind of a, a time goal for me and more about just like hitting a specific um, objective by the end of the week. That kind of helps me stay sane. <laughs> now, what do you do for your, your day job? I work for a university as a recruiter. So I'm at the University of Arizona um, as an admissions counselor. And so I go out and I talk to the, the high schoolers and the transfer students at the community colleges and just help them figure out their options, you know, um, outline kind of the opportunities that U of A has and then how do you, you know, make yourself marketable for college and yeah, so high school, community college, people who are thinking about going on to the university and talk to them about what the application process looks like, getting financial aid and kind of talking them through that whole um, pipeline. So it's uh, it's very time consuming, but it's something that I've been doing since I was a freshman in college and um, know that I really appreciated getting that support when I was you know, going on to college because I'm first generation, you know, from low, in low income family. And so so it's very rewarding for me to have kind of a helping profession on the side. That's awesome. Now, you also told us that you work with the Tucson Festival of Books as well. Yeah, I did that last year. So that happens on the U of A campus. So it's like literally right next door to where I work, like a five minute drive from my apartment. And um, and it's huge. I mean, we the, the U of A starts marketing for that, like, um, you know, years in advance sometimes to promote the ones that are coming up. And and um, so so it's just a whole lot of fun getting involved in that. And in the past, I, I had only been going like as an attendee, just walking around. And then this past year was the first one that I actually had a booth and, and sold some books and just had a blast, you know, coming back to do that in a different capacity because I've been going to that festival for years. So Yeah, it's different being behind the booth versus just walking through the aisles. Now, how does an author get involved in the, um, the festival of books? So this past year, I went through the author pavilion. So you can actually sign up on the Tucson Festival of Books website for, um, you know, different time slots if you just want to have a couple hours in a booth to sell your books. Um, I've been in talks with the people who work for the Pima County Library because they're the ones who um, kind of arrange, you know, different author events that happen. So I've been in various stages of communication with them to see if I can get involved in panels and stuff. We'll, we'll see how that all goes, but otherwise you can uh, pretty much just sign up on, on the website and you could either do like a full a full time booth, which is a, a little bit more expensive, or you can just have like a couple hours in the pavilion. And, um, and that's what I did last year. I really had a lot of fun with that. And nothing yes. beats like that, that real bond of being face to face with somebody and talking to them because you're know, sending an email, hey, I'm interested in this. It, it tends to get ignored, whereas if you connect with somebody who's involved in the programming and you can yeah. physically talk to them, a lot of times you get better results. Um, mm -hmm. As far as like panels go, the uh, Vegas Festival of Books is happening in three weeks. And I had sent my emails in, you know, hey, I would love to do panels. I'm available. I'm a local author. Just let me know, you know, what you have scheduled and if you'd like me to come talk about anything. And I got no, 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 no. But I had made a friend with a rep at Barnes and Noble a few years ago, and I'd stayed in communications with her. And sure enough, a week ago, she emails me and says, you know, hey, Katie, we've got a panel we're putting together for the Las Vegas Book Festival. Do you want to be in on it? Absolutely. That's <laughs> I'd love to do that for a Comic-Con one day. Like that's my dream to, to do either the Tucson or the Phoenix one on a panel. I keep hearing that the Phoenix Comic-Con was cool. Um, yeah, I've been to those a number of years and it's it's just, it gets bigger every year. It's bigger every so year. so much fun. It's a blast, yeah. That's what I live for. <laughs> I have never, I've never been to any kind of Comic-Con, any kind of, of any kind ever. I mean, I've been to, you know, Walmart, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> I'd rather not go there, but <laughs> I've never been to any kind of con. So I really feel like my good friends out West need to take it upon themselves to fly me out West next spring for Phoenix Comic Con. I told you I would <laughs> shove you in my suitcase if you would fit. <laughs> you got to find a way to get the suitcase here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jacob, you have a new release coming out, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, February 20th, I believe, next year. Okay, well, tell us about the, the new release. Tell us about what's going on. Yeah, so it's the finale of the Order of the Bell trilogy. It's called The Hummingbird, and so it basically picks up, like, a minute after the the second book left off so you know after all the fairy tale characters have kind of reunited with their their families i won't get too much deeper because then that's spoiler territory but yes, um, no but spoilers. it's just kind of <laughs> um 
but essentially the third one is just like the no holds barred you know all the stakes are raised like it's the all-out war between the fairy tale characters their families and this evil queen that's that's come back from kind of years of sleep and she's getting ready to take over our world and so it's like this big battle um, in New York, and it was so much fun to write. It was, um, it's just the kind of what I'd been building up to for years, and it was just so much fun to sit down and like put all these scenes together after all, the, all those years of thinking about it. So, yeah. How do we approach new releases? How do we, you know, approach the marketing angle? And what's the excitement level for each book that you release? Does it differ? Is it the same? Do you have the same nail biting nerves every time a book comes out? Honestly, this this one I feel even more excited than I did for the second one at least. Um, or like the first one was just like lots of jitters and lots of excitement, and, and I'm feeling that again for this third one because it's you know kind of seeing a set come together, and you know I can finally see my trilogy. You know all the covers back to back to back, and uh, you know people can give me feedback on the whole, you know that's been in my head forever. Um, the second one was definitely very exciting, but you know, it was kind of a different feeling. Like I'd already done it once, and uh, but now I think I'm returning to that same level of excitement, you know, to for the third one because, um, you know, it's just putting out a complete set, and um, we're approaching it a little bit differently in terms of the marketing because in the past we've done you know the Facebook release parties, and I think we're we're going a little bit more towards Instagram this time because that's where a lot of the the YA market is. You know, they're for the most part they're on Twitter, Instagram, and so we're we're partnering up with some different bookstagrammers and um, you know Blaze Publishing has their own reps that we're kind of getting involved with and um, they're gonna have me do some takeovers where I'm basically gonna hijack their feeds and post some pictures and um, do some live videos and talk a little bit about the book kind of do some teasers and um, I think we're gonna be teasing the cover a little bit over the next couple of weeks and then we'll finally reveal the full thing on October 9th so uh, it's gonna be a little bit different than we've done in the past but I think it'll be very exciting Sweet. I'm hoping that you'll give your pals over here at Spilling Ink uh, an inside view into that cover before it uh, before it hits big, because I know sure. that we will want to see it. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> awesome. 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 So now, you you talked a little bit about Instagram. Now, I'm not very familiar with marketing on Instagram. I have my own personal Instagram account, which is filled mostly with pictures of that evil winged creature that was over here. Um, <laughs> but you know, how do you market on, on Instagram? You mentioned live videos and then because you, you don't really have a whole lot of a status on there. It's mostly the picture. So are you, you know, are you making your own, doing your own graphic design for that? Or do you have a bunch of specially made stuff just for Instagram or how do you do that? Um, Blaze puts together some things, you know, like they'll put together cover teasers and they even made some different designs for me to make bookmarks and buttons and stuff. Uh, for the most part, Instagram, I'm just kind of doing it as, you know, normal human beings. So I'm going off and, you know, taking pictures of my lunch or, you know, what I'm doing on the weekends and stuff. And and I'll, I'll try to keep it so like once a week, you know, I'm doing some sort of book plug saying like, you know, this character would definitely enjoy this for lunch today, or, you know, something like that. <laughs> um, but the Blaze Publishing is definitely all about, you know, um, sell, sell yourself, like connect with your, your readers on a personal level, level and let them see that you're just, you know, a, a normal human being. And then, you know, the books will kind of um, take care of themselves from there. And, and Blaze, you know, they'll do all the behind the scenes stuff, you know, getting it out to distributors and bookstores and such. But but they, they really kind of have the expectation that that I'm just being, you know, as genuine as I can and, um, and selling myself as, as Jacob rather than as the carver. So. That, One that's of, really important. And the uh, what was it? It was two weeks ago. Jason, you missed that episode. Dang it. Um, which one was it? It was the don't be an asshole. The the first rule of publishing club is don't be an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually um, Wes was the one who who came up with that slogan and he said it a few times. I was like, that's it. That's the tagline for our show. But that's absolutely true. Being real with your your audience, whether it be through social media or in person, that that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to turn it over to Yvonne, and I want to talk about the same topic with her. Working with bigger publishers, working with either agents or publicists. How do you approach new releases? What's the excitement level there, and how do you uh, how do you work with them, or you know, follow their orders? However, that that happens. Well. Like I said before, the, the bigger publishers, they really don't do a whole lot 
um, for a mid-list author. Um, you know, there's, I think that the Supernatural book I did that came out in June. <coughs> that one's got another huge crowd too, the Supernatural crowd. Oh yeah, big time, big time. I'm, I'm starting the I'm starting the series now. I know I'm like eight years too late, but um, yeah, it's it's got a huge following. Don't don't kill me, but I'm actually not a part of the supernatural fandom. I tried to make it through season one, and I didn't like it. And everyone keeps telling me just watch season two. It's better in season two, and I'm like, look, I just can't. I'm sorry. You know, I have heard <laughs> exactly that same thing, Katie, and I am struggling with the same thing. But I, I'm trying to do my due diligence here because I, I watched like four episodes, and I'm still, I, I'm still not a fan. But I. I I see all these awesome things that people post and I'm like, this has got to get amazing. I know I'm going to get hooked on this eventually. Yeah. So. You know, I think um, it took them a couple of seasons to kind of get their, their TV legs for that. Uh, it is really fantastic in the seasons as you go along. The book okay. that I did goes between season 10 and season 11. And by then, you know, obviously way before then they have all the kinks worked out. You know, they have awesome monsters and the relationship between Sam and Dean Winchester, it's just, it's so funny. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's like fire and water. You know, Dean is the fire, Sam is the water, and they never quite go over each other. There's bam all the time. And it's just, it's so much fun. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of marketing expected of me. I mean, I do it anyway. I post on Facebook, I post on Twitter. Sometimes we were getting like some of those little ribbons that you stick on your convention things that are kind of funny. And we always look for funny um, sayings to put on there. I do go to conventions. I do go to Phoenix Comic Con. And you know, when I go, I, I'm pushing the books, I'm pushing the books. And hopefully there's a bookseller there who has the books because otherwise I'm kind of sitting there twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> Um, but it usually does okay. It usually does okay. I just did a book signing at Barnes and Noble up in uh, Desert Ridge in Phoenix, and um, that was pretty fun. It was a multi-author event thing going on there, so that was pretty fun. I'll do book signings and, and stuff like that. So, now how do you go about setting up your appearances when it comes to a big event like Phoenix Comic Con? Well, we Wes and I have we've been doing Phoenix Comic Con for years just years and like Jacob we have we have a connection with um, the person one of the one of the people who sets up panels and this time it's more for the horror science fiction genre in the Pima library so you know every time it rolls around she contacts us and she says you know are you going do you want to go are you going to get a table do you want to be on panels and you know our answer is always yes it's always yes 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 so it's Phoenix Mark Phoenix Comic Con is a great marketing thing to to get your name out there and meet people and and you know shake the hands and and I won't say kiss the babies but take pictures of the dogs. <laughs> so it's it, you know that's a great thing. Conventions are a great thing. We're we're both members of the Horror Writers of America, and you know we we get their events and things going on in there and and. I, I've been a member of that since it started out as an idea uh, way back in the 80s. I'm not going to tell you when, but um, yeah, that's, you know, we, we just kind of do what we can. Wes is better at it than I am, I will say that. Um, and basically, I, I generally leave the appearances of the bookstore thing and Phoenix Comic Con. He's my travel manager and promotion manager. So he says, okay, we're going to be at this, and then we're going to have this panel here, and don't forget to go online and fill in the, the survey and fill in what you want for panels. Um, he's like the magic man. Now, when you when you go to these cons, do you are you bringing books with you, or what are um, you doing? It depends. You know, if, if there are booksellers there who don't, um, or who are going to have copies, we might bring a few but we'll keep them. We'll keep them off to the side, or we might bring a lot. But as long as the booksellers have the book, we won't sell our own copies. We'll say, you know, you can get it from the bookseller. You know, so other places 
we'll we'll sell them if there's no one there, you know, no bookseller there. And we will sometimes bring older books that are out of print. Okay. Well, well Katie, is there anything else we want to talk about tonight? We're kind of getting on in time here. Yep, we're coming towards the end. I think we touched on pretty much all the topics we wanted to. The uh, the new releases, working with the publishers, working with uh, the new release schedule. Now, Jason, do you have any new releases out? Was the Dragon one the last one that, that everybody released? Yeah, um, A Plague of Dragons, which was our anthology, which unfortunately is, is, is coming down off Amazon, or is it already down? I haven't checked, but my solo <sighs> story's up. Yep, yep. So... Um, it, it was a really fun anthology to, to work on, and unfortunately, it's, it's time has just kind of run out. So those of you who have managed to, to get a paperback copy or an, or an ebook, you're, you're amongst the lucky ones. Um, yes. But so right now, what I'm doing is um, I'm actually working on a short story collection, uh, which is going to be mostly horror. There's a little bit of fantasy in there, and there's going to be a couple dramas kind of Tear jerker dramas made me sad to write and made my wife cry, which is I consider a win. Yeah, it's uh, always a win. Yes, yes. If you can make them cry, you're doing something right. Absolutely. Um, so, <laughs> so that'll be really fun, and I think that that's probably going to come out um, around the same time as Jacob's new release, which is going to be next February. So I, I'm planning on next winter. Do you guys have a winter? Is it cold there in February out west? No, not that much. Okay. Oh my God! It's like <laughs> negative ten here in February. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I, I am well familiar with that horrid climate. <laughs> <laughs> but for us, uh, you know, it might a cold day is generally like fifty. Okay, that's that would be perfect. And it drops at night. It, it, we can have a thirty degree swing from day to night. Okay, that's pretty uh, incredible. Desert life. Um, but other than that, Katie, um, so the short story collection, I, I am working on a novel right now. I know I told you I wasn't going to do, do novels again for a while, um, but I am working on a very, very disturbing novel, a serial killer story um, that I am going to be going the traditional route with. So I'll be pursuing uh -huh. agents and traditional publishers and uh, mm -hmm. kind of seeing how things go that way. So. I've been cool. saving the idea to as something special to work on, so that's what I'm doing. Now, Katie, I know that you are working on a novel, and I know that you are keeping it close to the chest. Can you give us any hints at all on what you're working on? It's uh, Well, it's because I'm, I'm going to go traditional with this one, or I'm hoping to go traditional. That's the goal, that I haven't released too much information about it. Um, those who are in my reader group teasers. have seen teasers. Um, actually, Jacob has seen some of it. You have seen some of it, Jason. So you guys both know. I've selected certain readers that I, I know I can trust to give me feedback as I, you know, whittle it down to a publishable length because I don't want to be, you know, too wordy with it. And uh, I just started querying it. So I'm at that really super nervous stage of will anybody, you know, really like it and hopefully pick it up. We'll see. Um, but other than that, you know, just like, you know, any other working author out there always have something else going on. So there's a couple of other projects that I'm going to be working on because I'll still do indie publishing while I'm waiting to see if the traditional marketplace will pick up this book that I've geared towards them. Okay. Now, and I've, I self-published my second novel, which was uh, titled Delia, and it was kind of a a romantic thriller with some supernatural stuff thrown in there and um, I've actually been submitting that to several small presses as a previously published work which is which is kind of a tough thing to do but just because it was one of those stories that I thought it was a great story but I wasn't able to get it in front of people I'm not getting it in front of the right audience so I, I really needed some help with that so um, it's kind of cool that uh, going down a new path a little bit, and I know that we're, we're both doing that, both you and I, Katie, um, so it's scary and exciting at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah, so that'll, I, be, that'll be fun. Now, are you going to write, um, because you had Molten Heart was in the anthology that shall not be named, um, <laughs> are you writing a, <laughs> are you writing a follow-up to that? Are, are we continuing the story? What are you going to do? I, I will continue the story. I always go back to my readers and uh, I have a private Facebook group that I, I invite people to join if they're, you know, if they like my what I write, please join um, and I'll post the links below. 
But um, I always go back to my readers for feedback on everything. And I ask them, you know, is this a story you enjoyed? Is this a story you want to see more of? And if readers want it, I will write it. So it's, it's, I use them as my gauge. You know, I, I was hoping that we would be able to put it into another anthology. I was really hoping for that trilogy anthology we had talked about. But, you know, it, it doesn't always work out when you have a lot of people and everybody has their own schedules. And so even though the anthologies aren't going to happen, readers have requested it. So I will be writing the next step in that story. I haven't come up with a title yet for it, though. Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. So. Okay, cool. Well, we are about at the end of our time tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for joining us on another episode of Spilling Ink. Is there anything that either of you would like to talk about before we go? <laughs> no, that's okay, too. <laughs> you know, I, I, I would love to talk about this thing that I'm working on, but I can't. Oh, okay. um, I it, it is the strangest situation with a novelization that I've, that I've ever had. I cannot talk about it at all um, and I cannot re release any information until the actual written novel is completely approved Interesting. and that's going to be a while. <laughs> well when you do get closer to that point where you can talk about it maybe shoot us an email so we can know okay. what the super secret thing is because now I'm going to be thinking about it. <laughs> See, that, that's like that super secret stuff that, that Disney does with like rewriting the canon for Star Wars. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I just... Keeping that under tight wraps. Yeah. I, I've never had one that I couldn't at least say I'm working on this supernatural yeah. book or this, you know, whatever. And they're like, nope, can't even say that. I'm like, okay. Wow. I'm working on a thing. <laughs> That's cool. You could say I'm working on a top secret project and it's totally legit. Well, that sounds even guessing. cooler though. Yeah, you know, I can torment people on Facebook. Yeah. And then I'll get I'll get little private messages that say, You can tell me, I'll keep the secret. <laughs> I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> Oh. Well, you guys have been great talking to you, Jacob and Yvonne. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's, it was a pleasure learning about both of you um, and for you guys to add your insights into into the show. Um, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. Thank this is awesome. Much. Anytime. We'd love to have you back again. And for everyone else, we look forward to seeing you next week on another episode of Spilling Ink.